This week, we're going to be working with the morphology of an indigenous language. This language is called Bribri. It's an indigenous language from Costa Rica. And before we do that, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about indigenous languages, language revitalization, and our role with technology and revitalization. How we can make it so that these languages are uh, spoken by their community members and that maybe they can use their phones in their languages uh, so that they can incorporate their languages in more domains of their daily life. So the summary before we start is that, yes, languages are born and languages die. For example, nobody speaks Latin anymore. It transformed into Spanish, Italian, French, uh, Portuguese, and that's fine. However, in the present world, we have a situation where we have a few super large languages like English, like Spanish, and thousands of smaller languages, mostly indigenous languages, that could be spoken by as few as, as one or two people. Imagine if only like one... 80 year old person spoke English. That's what's happening on a very large scale. This situation is unfortunately human made. This happened because nation states, empires decided to make their territories linguistically uniform, to unite us around one country, one flag, and one language. Unfortunately, this process involves violence and coercion so that people who spoke minority languages would abandon them in favor of the super large languages such as English and Spanish. Minority languages should be preserved because of the role they have in people's lives. Imagine if all of a sudden someone told you you can't speak English anymore and that you can't speak in English to your parents. You can't say I love you to your parents in the language you always spoke to them. That's what's at stake here. People construct their identities through language and telling them that they now have to abandon this identity is something that might be undesirable to any human being. The process of making uh, sure that people don't stop speaking these languages, which is language vitalization, is difficult. But there are many successful efforts going on all over the planet, so it is possible. And technology can help us. It can help us uh, create environments for learning the languages. It can help us... Uh, create communities where the speakers of the language can continue to communicate with them through technology, through chat, and so forth. And in this, as computer scientists and programmers, we do have a role to play. This is a map of Arizona, and it's probably not the map of Arizona you're used to seeing. This is a map of all the indigenous communities in Arizona. There's a lot of diversity on planet Earth, but a lot of it is erased from our view to present a more uniform version. The map of Arizona you're probably used to just has like Tucson, Phoenix, Sedona, the Grand Canyon. But uh, underneath that, there's a ton of linguistic variation and, as you can see, of many different communities. This is probably what our world uh, looked like before there were like large nation states for example, where there were many groups that spoke many different languages. However, our world is different. We have just a few languages that are spoken by tens of millions of people, hundreds of millions of people. This is parallel to what we see in the natural world, where uh, um, 80, 100 years ago, we had many varieties of vegetables, of fruits, but in the present world, we have many fewer varieties of all of these. With the reduction um, of species and the reduction of the environment, we've also seen a reduction in linguistic uh, diversity throughout planet Earth. And as a matter of fact, places with a lot of ecological diversity, as shown in the map, are also places with a large linguistic diversity. So something is happening on planet Earth. Unfortunately, what's happening is that um, people want to build unified nation states and in doing so demand that everyone speak the same language so that we can be one people. When they do that, they tend to get violent. This uh, illustration on the right says, speak French, be clean. Clean like you're dirty if you speak something else. There was a campaign uh, in France in the 1800s called the shaming, the public shaming, to shame speakers of other languages into speaking French and to shame them publicly. Uh, 
So much so that there were many large languages in France, like Occitanian, for example, that have almost disappeared because French has taken over all of the country. On the upper left, we have a Welsh not, not as an N-O-T. What this is, is a kind of pendant that teachers had. So you had to speak English in school, but if they caught you speaking Welsh, they would put it around your neck. The only way you could get it off of you would be to find some other kids speaking Welsh and to wrap them out and to put it on their neck. And whoever was wearing it at the end of the day, ah, got a beating. This is a whole name for that. This, uh, the one on the lower left, is the exact same thing, but for Japan. It was used in Okinawa. So if someone was caught speaking Okinawan instead of standard Japanese, they would get it. At the end of the day, bah, beating. And fortunately, people have been beaten all over planet Earth, beaten into speaking the majority languages. In, in Latin America, we had awful things. They would make... They would beat children, they would make them kneel into bottle caps. It was an incredibly painful process. And this made it so that, imagine that happened to you in school, where they would beat you for speaking something. They would make you uh, kneel over corn kernels, uh, like popcorn kernels. How painful would that be? Would you want, to, want that for your children? Who would want that for their children? The first reason why languages are lost is voluntary change, where parents have suffered this and then they don't want their children to suffer the same punishments. There were schools here in the US where, as you can see, they would take humiliating pictures of uh, people who are Native American and then show them transformed into like a good and useful person and tell them that, you know, your children must speak English because this is the language where they're going to get their sustenance and so forth. Of course, if you, uh, if you beat someone and, and deny them their culture and deny them their world, of course they're going to think that you should speak English. A second reason why languages are lost is forced change, where there are explicit laws that force you to speak a language. This happened in Spain during the 20th century, where in the dictatorship that they had in between the 1930s and the 1970s, minority languages like Catalan and Basque were brusquely oppressed. If they caught you singing in Catalan, you could go to prison. If they caught you teaching any of these languages, you could go to prison as well. So there would be explicit laws against using anything that was not Spanish. Finally, of course, loss of population can kill language off, like genocide, like killing everyone on an island, like having bounties over you know, over heads of an entire population, like happened in Tasmania, for example, parts of California. So languages can be lost for all of these reasons, because people are convinced that they need to speak English, because people are forced by law to speak English, or because indigenous communities suffer genocides. When this happens, when languages die, um, and we don't say die anymore, by the way. We say that languages go dormant because hopefully there will be a possibility in the future to reawaken them. So when people stop speaking languages, many things are lost. Traditional knowledge about the world, for example, ecological knowledge, knowledge about the possibilities of the human mind. There's many ways in which human language can work, which are not present in English, Spanish, French, for example. Um, human diversity, for example, obviously diversity is in point of view and, and how people organize themselves. But maybe the most important reason why languages should be preserved and revitalized is because of indigenous sovereignty. It's because it, um, it allows people to tell their own stories in their own way and to preserve their agency and their voice. Sovereignty is a very precious uh, thing for indigenous communities, and keeping their language is a part of expressing that. Make, being able to project my being the way I want it and to have the world talk to me in my language is to them an expression of indigenous sovereignty. How is language lost? Languages are lost when they are displaced from domains of usage. For example, 
if you are texting in English with your cell phone, then you're going to use English. But what if you suddenly had to use some other language when you're texting? That's going to reduce the circumstances when you're using, in which you're using your language. What if you suddenly had to watch movies in a different language or read the newspaper in a different language or watch the news in a different language? The opportunities to use your own language would be further and further reduced to maybe use just your family. What if suddenly uh, your younger siblings spoke a different language and you could only use your language with elderly people, for example? As each of these domains is lost, people start using the language less and less to a point where there's, there's going to be at some point a generation that does not speak the language at all. And when that happens, only parents will speak the language. After 20 years, only grandparents will speak the language. And after a time, only very elderly people are going to speak the language. And after they die, you're going to, the language is going to become dormant. Again, it doesn't die because there might be documents or the probability of bringing it back to life at some point, but it will go dormant because nobody actively speaks it. How can we stop this from happening? Uh, government, for example, can help by issuing language policies um, and making sure that the language is used in the government, for example, and uh, in the courts when making law and so forth. But mostly, language can be revitalized through community-led efforts, through grassroots, grassroots efforts, through um, bilingual schools, for example, where children learn both languages, English and Hawaiian, for example, through something called language nests, where you place children with grandparents or, or elderly people so that the language can be transmitted through them, through master apprentice, where that's looking for someone who speaks the language and that you can take you as an apprentice and you can uh, speak it together. And technology can help with this process. Uh, we can help in making, for example, language learning tools from websites to apps and so forth. Uh, by the way, many, many communities have different feelings about whether outsiders should learn the languages. Some communities love it when outsiders learn the language. That was the case in Maori. Where we were all actively encouraged to learn it. Some communities in North America do not want outsiders to learn the language. And this is because when outsiders have learned it, they have abused the community. So there's an unfortunate history where outside and outsiders should not learn the language unless explicitly permitted by community members. If they have permission, we can create language learning tools. We can use technology to help create speech communities, to help create circumstances where people can use the language. For example, people use the Mexican language Zapotec on Twitter and they write on Twitter, they write their messages every day, and it's a way to bring this language back into the sphere of everyday life. Helping create interfaces in the language, and this is mostly where we come in. Natural language processing can make it so that we create speech recognition for the languages, that we can provide predictive texting. Um, this is a phone also in the Zapotec language providing tools so that people can create media so that they can you know, take the people the things they love like star wars and put them in their own indigenous language this is a language called tuscarora from new york and later in the class i'll show you what darth vader sounds like in tuscarora when we try to use these languages in some technological mean we try to give them some connotation of modernity and them being part of our everyday world to try to create a kind of symbolic impact that will uh, help younger speakers and younger members of the community to realize that, yeah, this language can actually be used for cool stuff. Like, I can actually use Navajo on my cell phone, for example. And what we should be trying to create is opportunities for interactions, for people to use the language actively. We will come back to this topic in later videos. And because there's so many languages, there's a lot of work to do. There's approximately 7,000 languages in the world, most of them indigenous, and there's natural language resources for very few of them, uh, maybe a hundred. 
a low resource language is one where there isn't a lot of data for us to train language models. So many of the magical things we can make in the class with deep learning and so forth, it's very difficult to use them without any data. The field of low resource languages in NLP is to try to use the language that we have to make these tools work. Uh, in general, we, we're trying to figure out how to make tools so that we can, so that the speakers can bring their languages back into their everyday life. Again, in summary, the current situation with indigenous languages where there are some super large languages and thousands of smaller languages on the verge of going dormant is unfortunately human made. And we have a lot of work to do to establish a world where these languages are spoken and thriving.